Okay, here we go. 7.4a. Uh, homework. And remember, it's a video, so you can pause and rewind. Here we go. Okay, so uh, of the many lessons we learned about trig, this is one of the more challenging ones because in the end, I'm going to not be telling you steps or procedures. I'm going to be giving you recommendations of how to perform these things. Uh, most of the time in math, say 99% of the time, to solve a problem, uh, you follow a, a series of steps, perform an algorithm, plug in numbers into a formula, you get to an answer. And there's a few times uh, when uh, the, the question itself is very open-ended and there's lots of avenues uh, that you can go down to solve it. And this is one of those, those occasions. Uh, you're going to hear me uh, um, analogize, uh, uh, given an analogy of that this is like a, a geometric proof where there's no one way of doing it. There might be multiple ways and there's no clear cut way of getting to the answer from the start. So with that, were those words of encouragements, here we go. All right, I love trig. You know, the but here is that sometimes uh, trig has a certain level of uncertainty and today is one of those. Uh, you remember trig, remember trig identities? We've seen this before. Uh, you don't need to write this one down. You've written it down before. Trig identities are equality, so it's going to have an equation or symbol, uh, that have uh, involved some sort of a, a, a trig function. So a sine, a cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, or cotangent. Uh, we've seen many of these before. This is just a, a series of ones that we've all seen before, and we've used nearly every single one of these multiple times. Uh, but the list is rather long, so we added some more, and I don't know if you remember these, and this was two chapters ago when we added these. Uh, we had the Pythagorean identities, the quotient identities, reciprocal identities, and whether it's an even or odd uh, identity as well, too. And the but here is that there are also minor variations of each one of these. Because all the ones I just showed you are equations, we can, here's the Pythagorean identities, we can do a little bit of algebra to each one of these and come up with new identities. Now, we call them minor variations because they come from the original one. So the one there on the left, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. If we just do a little bit of algebra and solve for sine squared, we get another one. Or if I solve for cosine squared, I get another one. It's still a trig identity, but it comes from that original Pythagorean identity. So we call it a minor variation. Uh, and there were three more, so we got a total of lots of these. So every time we do a trig identity, Potentially, and if it's an algebraic equation, we can have multiple minor variations that pop up. So keep that in mind as we do these. Uh, and there's lots of other identities. I've shown you many of these. If you open to the last page of the book, uh, on the inside cover, you see all those identities. So there's lots of new ones, and we will cover, and I said this before, we're going to cover every one that's on that back cover. Um, this is that one teachers that I copied for told you about. And these can be rather intimidating, but we will learn all the ones that are listed right here. And we know many of these right here. So what are we doing? We're doing three things today. Uh, for this section, it's going to take us two days to do this. But the three things that we're going to doing is something called simplifying. Okay, we've done that before. Uh, we're going to do a new thing, and it's called show that. It sounds like it's complicated. It's not that bad. And the last thing that we won't do until uh, next class is something called establish identity. And establish identity is the most challenging of them all, but we'll save that for the next class. Uh, all these are kind of like geometric proofs. We're not going to be proving something necessarily, but it, they're kind of like a ge uh, geometry proof in the sense of, well, they give you a problem. You might understand the problem. They'll give you a, an ending point of where you need to go to, but you might not know how to get there. And that's the challenge of these, especially the establish the identity thing. Okay. So a lot of people like to scream when they see these things because these are some of the more challenging trig things that we will do. Um, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, it's hard to know if you're going down the right path. You may do a lot of work and find out it didn't get you anywhere. Uh, all of these end up being easy when somebody shows you how it's done. None of them are technically hard or challenging uh, once you see how they're done. But knowing the right path to take is, it, that's the challenge itself. Okay, enough talking, let's do some. 
Uh, I do want you to notice on this one teacher's uh, uh, little uh, cheat sheet on trig identities right here, that middle section there that I just highlighted. Here's it blown up. And notice uh, she says, do something or try something. That's not very great advice. It doesn't tell you what to do. It says try something. And that's what today's class is on, is what is that something that you should be trying? I'm going to give you four somethings that you potentially could try. But the problem is there isn't a specific one that you should use uh, given a scenario, meaning that you're, I'm going to give you four things you potentially can do. You got to pick the one to do and go down that path to see if it arrives to you to the answer or gets you to that answer. All right. So the easy way to do it is just to, to do some examples. So here we go. Um, it's kind of like a proof. Uh, some will be challenging until you see the trick. But when you see the trick, you'll say, OK, that wasn't too bad. Uh, I, me personally, as a mathematician, I still struggle at doing some of these. Uh, they are frustrating at times. All right. Don't panic. Right. All right. So the, the, the easiest game of them all is the simplifying game. And I'll just say you've done simplifying before. The, the hardest part of simplifying is knowing that you are done. How do you know you're done? I'll make a, uh, an example here of something that you know. Well, there's truly no answer that you're done. You're done when you think you're done, unless somebody smarter than you tells you you're not done. For instance, look at this fraction right here. If I were to ask you to simplify it or reduce the fraction, I think we could see that it's all, uh, that both of those numbers, numerator and denominator, are divisible by two. So we could get probably all of us to that point, and then we're kind of, you know, the question is, am I done? And remember, the answer to that is, well, you're done if there's no other number that's divisible into the numerator and denominator except for one. And it turns out that's a challenge until somebody smarter than you says, hey, look, 17 goes into both of them. Now you're done. So remember that as you're doing these trig identities, that you're not done until you're really done. And sometimes it takes somebody smarter than you to tell you that there's so, another step that you could take. Now, luckily for you, um, attached on uh, the, the email I sent you, uh, you're going to see the answers to the questions. So you will know that you're done because your answer will match the one in the back of the book. All right. So I said I was going to give you four pieces of advice. Uh, to simplify, advice number one is rewrite what you got in the hopes that something cancels or maybe something can turn into the number one. Now, the first one is kind of self-explanatory. We're going to do, we're going to change something and hopefully something cancels. The second one needs a little bit of explanation. So I'll show you both examples here. So here's our first one. It says cotangent theta over cosecant theta. And we're supposed to simplify this. Well, as we look at that fraction, it looks pretty simple already. It's just got one numerator, and one denominator. So you are, I don't know, you're led to believe that maybe this is as simple as it can get. But once again, it turns out there's something that we can do to this. So key advice number one is, if possible, rewrite what you got using another trig identity and see if something cancels. Okay, so let's see how that would work. Well, the numerator is cotangent. The denominator is cosecant. So if we look, and we're going to do something, if we look at the, the, the possible things that we can do, if we notice all the trig identities we have so far, we see that there are times when it says cotangent and cosecant, right? So if we were to write cotangent as cosine theta over sine theta, and if we were to rewrite cosecant as one over sine theta, watch what I do, right? There's my two trig identities I'm about to use. It would look like this. And notice I have a fraction over a fraction. And if I multiply by the reciprocal or do a copy dot flip, we notice that the sine uh, thetas would cancel, and I'm left with just cosine. And I think you would agree that cosine theta is simpler than cotangent theta or cosecant theta. Now, I'm going to back up here just for a second and go back to this screen. I want you to notice, uh, I haven't done this in a while. Let me see if I can annotate here. Um, I want you to notice that there was another thing that said cotangent, but it said 1 over tan theta. So the question is, uh, how did I know to use this one instead of the other one? And the answer is, well, a little bit of experience uh, is how you do this, okay? So how did I know to use that one? Well, because I knew if I wrote it as, co as cosine theta over sine theta and the other one is one over sine theta, that eventually I would get to where things cancels. Okay, all right, cool. 
All right. So once again, I'm going to rewrite them with the hopes of something canceled. Hey, something canceled. and I'm left with something simpler. And that's how I know I'm done. All right. Um, continuing on, what about uh, that second part there? Rewrite in the hopes of something equals one. Well, I'm going to remind you that if we ever get a sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, I can write that as the value one. So here's an example of that. Oh, and by the way, that's not just one trig identity. There's two more. Uh, if we do a little bit of rearranging of the other two Pythagorean identities, that's that tan squared theta plus one equals secant squared. I just do a little bit of algebra, move the secant squared to, to one side, or sorry, move the tan squared to the one side, then that also equals one. And the same thing for that last one. So those three things in blue, if you could ever get that somewhere in your equation, you can erase all of that and just simply write the number one. And that's pretty, that's pretty helpful. So why are we doing this? Remember, uh, this is pre-calculus. When we get to calculus, we're going to be doing a lot of things with trig uh, 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 functions, and it's much easier to work with cosine theta than it, were, it, it is to work with a, a fraction of, of cotangent over cosecant. Okay. Um, also, if we're doing some adding, subtracting, eventually it's it's obviously uh, easier to, to add and subtract things when they're much more simpler form. Okay. By the way, we just introduced a new identity. You don't need to write this one down, but cotangent theta over cosecant theta is equal to cosine theta. So if you ever see that, you can simply rewrite it. Are you going to remember that one? Probably not. Uh, I'm going to refer to these as our arrows. You keep arrows in a quiver, and so these are the tools that we use to help us simplify a problem. We're going to get four of these today. There's more, but we'll call this arrow number one. So arrow number one is you just simply change what you got in the hopes that something cancels. Uh, you're especially looking for tangent, cotangent, because those can be written as uh, sine over cosine or uh, cosine over, over sine. And that's a, a pretty valuable skill. All right. Uh, remember I said there were three games. We're only doing two of them today. The, the second game is the show that game, right? So the second game, here's how this is done. They would be given a scenario. Uh, here's a problem. It says show that cosine theta over one plus sine theta is equal to one minus sine theta over cosine theta. And then, luckily for you, it tells you exactly how to do it. It says by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by one minus sine theta. So what is this really asking us, right? What it's asking us to do is to show that the left side of that equation equals the right side of the equation. And it tells us how to do it. It says multiply the top and the bottom, the numerator and the denominator, by one minus sine theta. So I need to show that the left side equals the right side. Right now, they don't. I mean, well, they do, but I'm saying they don't visibly look the same. I want to make them visibly look exactly the same. So I need to turn that red into the black on the right side. I need to turn that red into 1 minus sine theta over cosine theta. So how do I do that? Well, it tells us what to do. It says in order to turn that red into the black, I'm supposed to take the red and multiply by one minus sine theta, top and bottom. Remember that means, means we're multiplying by one. So we're not changing any values because we're multiplying by one, but we're certainly changing its appearance. Okay, so let's do this math. Um, if we do that math, by the way, this is called multiplying by the conjugate. Remember the conjugate is either the numerator or denominator, we write the opposite. So instead of writing one plus sine theta, we write one minus sine theta. And this is called multiplying by the conjugate. This will be our second arrow. All right, so if we do that, on the top, notice I didn't distribute the cosine theta, but on the bottom, I did that multiplication. Sine times sine is sine squared. So this is one plus sine theta times one minus sine theta, turns into a quadratic. Middle terms drop because it's one plus and one minus. And so we're left with one minus sine squared theta. Uh, okay, now what, right? What are we gonna do now, right? Well, it turns out that one minus sine squared theta should be sending your antennas a twitching, right? So that's something that we've seen before as an identity, right? Uh, remember the second part of that, to simplify, rewrite in hopes of something is one. Well, I don't have a one, but if we look at the Pythagorean uh, identities, right? All right? Do you see it? Look at that one right there. Uh, if we move the sine squared theta to the other side that by subtracting, that would equal cosine squared theta. Well, that's simpler, right? So one minus sine squared theta, right, is equal to cosine squared theta. That's one of those minor variants. Okay, that's useful for ours. I refer to it as, a, as you start seeing these things or anticipating these things is that you're seeing the matrix appear in front of you. 
So I can take that red part right there, and that's equal to cosine squ squared theta, excuse me. Now look what we got. On the top, we have a cosine theta. On the bottom, we have a cosine squared. Remember, cosine squared theta, there's two of them. So I could cancel one off the top and one off the bottom. The top one would completely disappear, and the bottom would turn into cosine theta. And on the top, you're left with one minus sine theta. Remember, that's what we were trying to show. Remember, we were trying to show that the left side is equal to this right here, and we just did it. So this is the show that principle right here. And for all the ones that we have for homework, they'll tell you exactly what to do in order to show that. Okay. We won't do too many of these examples right here, but we'll do enough, hopefully, to make you feel comfortable. All right, so now our quiver has two arrows. So arrow number one was, remember, change something to hope that something cancels. Uh, quiver number, or arrow number two is, hey, if you can, multiply the conjugate, multiply by the conjugate. Now, you won't always have a conjugate, right? Uh, but remember, that's the opposite of the numerator denominator. So for instance, examples here, in blue, if we multiply that by the conjugate, we would multiply top and bottom by one minus sine theta over one minus sine theta. Remember, we're just multiplying by one. Another example, doesn't have to be in the denominator, it could be the numerator. So we could multiply top and bottom by one plus tan theta on that green one. Okay, makes sense? So that's arrow number two. The issue with these two, these arrows, we got two of them now, is well, which one do you use? Well, clearly, if you don't have a, something you could multiply by the conjugate, you can't do that. But if you do, is this the right choice? And the answer is, well, maybe it is, right? But it is, remember that the device that one teacher said was try something. This is the second thing that you can try, multiplied by the conjugate, okay? Uh, last example, cosine theta plus two, we can multiply top and bottom by cosine theta minus two. Okay, so two things for homework, simplify and show that, but we're gonna have uh, four techniques that we can uh, do for this. All right, so a little bit of practice. Uh, this one's a little bit more challenging. This is gonna be arrow number three. So it says simplify as a single ratio. That means write that as one fraction. Well, how would I write that as one fraction? Okay, easier problem. Let's say that I had, uh, I don't know, one third plus one half. And I ask you to write that as one fraction. Well, clearly, how would you write that as one fraction? You would, you know, get common denominators and then simply add. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get common denominators and add for this one, All right? That's what you're going to do. All right, common denominators. Well, what's the common denominator there? Uh, I don't know, but I do know that I can take the two denominators multiplying together to get to a common denominator. That's what I'm going to do. So that's my common denominator. If we look at our first fraction, we're missing, let's see, I'm missing a cosine u. And on the second fraction, I'm missing a sine u, okay? So uh, I'll do that math. Uh, well, on the left side, we'd get that. On the right side, we get that. Uh, before we do them, I want you to take a look at it. And if you notice, right, if you notice, we look at this right here and this right here, they're just opposites of each other. Now, they're written backwards, but that's fine. Two times three is the same as three times two. But I got a plus sine u, cosine u, and I got a minus cosine u, sine u. So those two things would cancel each other out or go away, or turn to zero, and we would be left with, let's see, what did I cross out? Cosine u plus cotangent u sine u all over the common denominator. Well, technically, we have done what they asked us to do, is we've written it as a single fraction. But remember, for all fractions, your last step is to reduce the fraction if you can. Well, that doesn't translate well to this one because it's trig, but what they're really asking us to do is simplify. So let's look that over and let's see if there's anything that we can change. And hopefully it jumps out, out at you, arrow number one, change something. Notice I got a cotangent U sitting right there. And we know that cotangent is defined as, uh, well, I mean, it doesn't look simple, let's simplify. We're gonna do something. Uh, that's defined as cosine theta over sine theta. So if I rewrite that as cosine uh, u over sine, I'm rewriting cotangent u. Notice that the sines, you're starting to see it, the sines cancel. And then I got a cosine u plus a cosine u, and that would be two cosine u's. But now I got a cosine u on the top and a cosine u on the bottom, so they would cancel. And I would be left with two over sine u. And that is clearly more simple 
than what we started with, and it's one fraction. But the question is always, am I done? And the answer here is, well, yeah, you're pretty much done right here. Uh, if you wanted to write it as a non-fraction, remember one over sine theta, uh, that's the definition of cosecant theta. So you could write that as two cosecant u. Hopefully that made sense right there. Uh, I would accept either answer there in yellow. They probably in the back of the book wrote the uh, the one without the fraction because, hey, who wants to deal with fractions if you don't have to? Okay. All right, moving on. So uh, we, got a, we got our third arrow, right? First arrow, change something. Hopefully something cancels. Second arrow, if you can, multiply by the conjugate. And now our arrow number three is, hey, if you got fractions, multiple, well, then add or subtract them. Right? Term into one fraction. One fraction is always easier to deal with than two. All right. And in the process of doing that, you got to get common denominators. Hopefully when you do that, something cancels. Generally, you typically have to change some things as well, too. But when it works, it works well. All right. Last one. Now, this one's still challenging. It'll give us our final arrow of the day. Um, and I'll give it to you. For, I mean, I won't tease you. I'll just give it to you for free. All right, so here's what we're given. We're given, well, it's one fraction right there, and we got a big hot mess top and bottom. We got lots of stuff going on. So the idea for this is if you can factor, well, then factor, right? Notice, look at the denominator. Both terms, first term and the second term, have a tangent in it. And uh, I'll just throw this out here. They both have to be tangent of the same uh, variable, in this case, v. If you had a tan u and a tan v, then the, you couldn't factor this. But hey, look, we got a tan v in both of those terms, so we could factor the bottom. So look, I factored the bottom. I took a tan v out of the first and second. I got that one. All right. Uh, you might be looking at that sine squared v minus 1 and say, hey, we did this before. That's that Pythagorean identity right? Sine squared theta minus one. Uh, well, how could I get a sine squared theta minus one? Well, I could uh, I could move the one to the left side, the cosine squared to the other side. So I would get a negative cosine squared theta, right? Uh, that should have a minus there. So uh, that's a mistake. I caught that in class and I forgot to change it. So that should also have a minus sign right there. Okay. All right. So uh, I can replace that. So I can replace the top with that right there. And oh, what, what can we do now? Well, I could change that bottom tangent, right? Uh, tangent is uh, what? Cosine over sine. So I could, I'm sorry, sine over cosine. So I could change that. Um, but that didn't really do anything either. So this is one of those cases where you make a choice and you go down a path and the path kind of just wanders around and you never really make any pro. It feels like you're doing something. We did two things, but it never made anything simpler and notice nothing really cancels here. Even if we did a copy dot flip on the sine V over cosine V, nothing would cancel. So we chose the wrong path. Now, maybe uh, I had one person in class, right? Instead of going down the wrong path, right? They realized that this is also factorable. In fact, if you ignore the sine squared, and just think of that as x squared, well, x squared minus one is factorable, so is sine squared v minus one. x squared minus one factors to x plus one, x minus one. So sine squared v minus one factors to sine v plus one and sine v minus one. And notice if I write it like that, you can immediately see that I have something to cancel. Therefore, it turns into that. And then we get to the unending question of, am I done? That looks a whole lot simple, but it turns out we can do some more. I think I'm going to need a fresh page of paper to do this, right? So there's more we can do. So watch this, right? How do you know you're done? You're, you're done until you're not done, until somebody smarter than you tells you there's something else you can do. So uh, if you if you want to think about it for a second, pause the video. If not, I'll show you what to do. Hey, look, we got two things on the top, two terms on the top, one term on the bottom. We can split the fraction. Watch what happens when I split the fraction, right? So I can write that as sine v over tan v plus one over tan v. And I can write tan v as sine over cosine, right? And one over tan v is equal to cotangent v. Okay, okay, you're tracking, you're tracking. If I do a copy dot flip now, 
the sine Vs would cancel and I would simply be left with cosine V. And now the question is, are we done? And the answer is, it's about all I can think of we can do. To maybe there's something more, but that's all I can think that we can do to this one. So my suggestion to you is that when you're doing your homework, look at the answer uh, and keep working until you get to the answer. Okay. And I think you would uh, agree that the bottom there is, is easier than what definitely what we started with. All right. So our final arrow of the day, right, arrow number one, uh, rewrite. Hopefully something cancels. Arrow number two, if you can, multiply by the conjugate. Arrow number three, A, if you got two fractions, add or subtract them. Hopefully something cancels. Uh, and arrow number four is if you can factor, and hopefully something cancels. Notice there's a pattern here. Almost every one of these ends with something cancels. All right. So that's all we got for today. Uh, we did a couple practice ones and from homework in class, and they, they weren't as bad as I made them out to be. But uh, eventually, especially tomorrow's work, they become a bit more challenging. All right. Uh, I don't know when you're going to watch this, but if you do watch this and it's over the weekend and you have a question, send me an email. Uh, I'll send you a reply. If not, then when I see you on Tuesday, uh, I'll answer your questions. Uh, we can still we can do tutoring uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday night and Thursday night. Uh, or if you want to do it before school, that's fine as well, too. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about the test when you get back. All right. Good luck.